soon. We're going to spend the next 1,200 uh, seconds talking uh, about way too many things, in fact. But principally, we're going to talk about one thing, which is UI, HMI, the user interface. And the foundational assertion for this talk and for our work at Oblong Industries is that uh, really for the last 30 years, we've spent an increasingly small and vanishing amount of effort and time and attention on what might be the single most important aspect of computation, the user interface. And as a kind of contextual flavoring agent, I want to view that through the lens of professional work. We are all in this audience engaged in professional work or interested in work that itself is characterized by being more complex than an app. Um, so let's take a little swing through logic town here uh, just to sort of set the stage. So we all have professional tasks. We have work life and we have domestic life. Let's talk about work life. Um, the world is not getting simpler. Our work, the workflows, the work patterns, the tasks are not getting simpler. They're just complicated. And that's OK. We need tools that make uh, them accessible to us. And we live in a world which is filled with computation. Uh, we are fully now uh, organisms, beings that are digital. That's, that's just who we are now. And so um, if we accept that, if we understand that, that means that all the work that we do that involves computation is completely circumscribed by the user interface. Because the UI is all you have. The UI is the computer. There are chips, and there are GPUs, and there's Ethernet, and all sorts of stuff. But you don't directly touch that. You can't directly interact with that or uh, manipulate it. All you can touch and see and smell and taste and manipulate is the UI. So effectively, the UI is the computer. And if that's the case, we can then conclude that, of course, the UI either is a limitation on what work can be done, how pleasurable uh, and engaging it is to do, or it can be an amplifier. And the starting point is that we're not doing nearly enough with the UI. That's either a lament, or if you see this uh, from the flip side, it's an enormous opportunity. If we could build a new UI, a better UI, well, that really might be something. And just to clarify, I'm not talking about the user interface for a particular application. That's little UI. I'm talking about big UI, the set of principles and glyphs and interactions, the mouse pointer, the pull-down menus, the scroll bars that basic vocabulary from which a particular UI is built. So we're talking about big UI here today uh, with the idea that it hasn't changed, not in a big way, in 30 years. Because if it had changed, then we could ask this question. This would make sense. Today, this makes no sense. Right? You could sort of ask, is your company a Windows shop or an OS X shop or a Linux shop? That sort of has meaning, although it's not that interesting or meaningful. But we want to get to a world where we can say, what UI do your people use to get their job done? So to look at uh, everything that got us here to where we are, let's examine the complete history of UI, all of it. It doesn't take very long. Modern UI we're talking about now. So let's go past the mid-60s, go past the early 70s, when com computation and your interest in computers meant that you had to sign up for a slot at the university or in your company to use the computer. That was an era of scarcity, computation was scarce. 1977, this happens. We move from scarcity to abundance. Suddenly, everyone who wants one can have a computer. And if you're pharmaceutically aided, you can stay up for 10 days straight hacking and coding. And this change from scarcity to abundance led to a Cambrian explosion of new ideas and new categories. Everything from modern video games, choplifter, to modern electronic music, music production, music performance. Uh, and categories of finance that changed the entire world, the electronic spreadsheet. I know we talk a lot about innovation today, but if we had a meter and we could go back, this might have been peak innovation, hard to say. What happens next? Well, we go from the one-dimensional command line where you're typing text in and text comes out. Maybe there's a little bit of graphics. It's hardly standardized. We go from that to a machine that can speak in pictures and that invites you to manipulate those pictures. So instead of lighting up the parts of brain that understand logic and language, we're still lighting those parts up, but we're now lighting up the huge human visual system, which understands space and spatial relationships and pictorial space. And we get this, and that's it. That's the last big step in UI. We're still using this today on our laptops, on our desktop machines, and so forth. So this circumscribes and limits all of the professional work that we do. Well, what happened next? Actually, the next step was that we took a step backwards. Because in 1994, 95, 
once the internet had spread widely enough, someone invented something that gave everyone access to the internet, the web. And that's great. So now, instead of having 20,000 different applications, you've just got one, the web browser. The implication and the suggestion is it's all you need to access an entire world of distributed information, which is true. But look at the UI. We've taken a huge step back. So with one invention, we've gone back to 1984 and maybe earlier than that. This thing is not very capable in terms of its UI. And I would assert that it's only in the last two years that we've gotten back inside the web browser to where we were in, let's say, 1995 at Next Computer with their beautiful operating system and UI there. So we've finally gotten back to where we should have been. Then we take one more step backwards. And this is going to be contentious, I know, because what comes next is this. And these are beautiful objects of computation. You take them out of their boxes, and they sing to you. They show you pictures and movies. But think about the UI. The UI is a big step backwards. Suddenly, we're back to where we were with the Apple II Plus, or the Atari 800, or the TRS-80, or the Sinclair ZX-80, or whatever it was. You can only run one program at a time. Is that any way for you to live as a professional? I suspect not. So that's a vacuum. Let's see if we can fill it. We're going to take a quick swing through eight little chapters. Some of them are lessons. Some of them are observations. Some of them are prototypes. Some of them are live functioning systems that are being used around the world. And these aren't together going to quite answer the entire call that the initial slide set out. This isn't the entire future of the UI, but I hope that it suggests some of what that future could be like. One, let's explode the displays. Let's at least ask the question, what would happen if there weren't a rectangle, a hard physical rectangle around every set of pixels in the world? What if you could get the pixels to come out and populate the space of interaction? You'd get something like this. This is from the mid-1990s. This is at the MIT Media Lab a system called the Luminous Room, where we're merging the digital and the physical world. And in fact, instead of making people sit in front of a computer like this, we're allowing people and people's hands to do what they love to do, to reach out, manipulate, understand the physical world. And now the machine does the hard work of figuring out what's going on in the physical world and projecting down important information. In this urban planning and architecture example, it's finding the buildings and creating shadows so that you can perform intershadowing studies like this. That goes on for a while, but what we've learned is that it's important to de-abstract the pixels. Let's think about pixels as physically present in the room and not, not abstractly confined to a rectangular display space. And let's let human hands, these beautiful instruments evolved over 500,000 years, let's let them do what they're actually meant to do. Two, take all of that learning, take all of the learning from before and all the stuff you're going to see in a minute after this and build it into a software stack, an operating system, so that you do the hard work once, then it's done, and then the world can start to build applications with UIs the way they always should have been. That system is called GSpeak. It's a kind of distributed operating system that runs across machines and processors and displays. Uh, and if you come to our laboratory in Los Angeles or Barcelona or elsewhere, you can actually see this stuff. So this is Minority Report, but there's no visual effects here. Yes, there's gloves. And yes, you can reach out. You can step back from lots and lots of pixels and point, and by pointing, manipulate the entire space. If you think for a moment about pointing, as a human gesture, it's the most magical of all. It's a geometric gesture that connects your body to distant space, and it does it in a social way so that everyone else can understand what's going on. So teach the machine to understand pointing. You point in free air, then you come down close to a surface, new kinds of interactions happen, and then when you touch the surface, you get that frictional advantage that we all know and love already from touch surfaces. But there's a continuum of interaction. Sometimes, as here, you need to reach out and just grab some data, pull it toward you, understand it as you would understand a piece of the physical world. Sometimes you have physical pixels that have to obey the same set of commands, the same vocabulary, the same grammar, and so on. And then navigation is critically important. We've got 20, 25 years of really beautiful experiments in computer graphics-assisted visualization, data visualization, but it's halfway. It's dead. You have no way of controlling it. Your hands are tied behind your back. So instead, navigate through it and light up the other hemisphere of your brain, the one that understands environments, that, that learns cities by walking through them, walk through your data. So teach software about the four most important dimensions that define all of our daily lives, and that for some reason no programming language has ever addressed as a fundamental foundational component, space and time. Build that into the operating system. Build it into the computer so that it never forgets again. Three, strange, strange, strange liability historical liability of the way we've been building computers for 30 years is that all the stuff stops at the physical boundaries, the hard plastic or metal edge. 
why can the pixels not extend to the next display? They ought to be able to. It's been that way so long that it seems, of course, every device has its own pixels and that's it. But what if you could extend the UI? What if you could extend the interaction, the display, the applications, the documents, off the edge of one screen and onto the next if they're close enough? What you get is something like this. This is a little tiny piece of media that's jumping around five different displays, being driven by three computers, running two low-level operating systems. It's very hard to accomplish technically with, uh, with an engineering team that built G-Speak, but it's easy for the programmer who wrote these 50 lines of code. And the most important thing is that the user gets exactly what she cares about and expects, which is that if there's pixels, you get a continuous space to work with. Similar idea here, we're plucking a little bit of digital information uh, an L system tree from one operating system running on a laptop to a big screen being driven by Linux, taking another one, pulling it back. The gross motions are captured by a Connect, uh, Microsoft Connect unit. The fine motions here that are rearranging the tree's limbs are being driven by a leap motion sensor. And the point is you get a continuum, a continuum of display, a continuum of interaction, a continuum of input devices. Again, you're modeling the physical world to create the digital world. The physical world is where we're comfortable. We know the rules. They're excellent rules. We make the digital world work like that. Uh, and we're in much better shape. So from now on, when you build systems, assume that they won't stop at the edge of the screen. Four, we need to get much more expressive with the elements of the UI. If you think about what happens when you use a mouse, what happens on screen? You've got a little arrow. And the arrow is a picture, but it's pointing to a single pixel. It's pointing to a zero-dimensional spot in a two-dimensional space constrained by a rectangle. And that zero-dimensional point is everything that the computer thinks about you. That's your representation in the space. And it's kind of insulting. We can do better. We can make the analog of those kinds of input and output glyphs so that they tell us more about ourselves and about what the machine thinks of us. So here's a little tiny example a more complex sort of nested circle representation that shows you what happens as you move and scale an element. We turn uh, linear motion in Z, as you'll see in the next example, into rotational motion, which is a nice trick that keeps the glyph compact. And so as we push forward in just a second here, what you'll see is that the two circles mate, and then they begin to spin, right? So what's happening is that that glyph is showing you not just what's going on at the moment, not just where you are, but it's showing you what you're doing and what might happen next if you do this or this or this. That's an important idea because we want to render in a more complex world, in a more sophisticated world, in a more nuanced world, we need help. We need hints about what, where we are, what's, what the machine thinks of what we're doing, and where we might go. Five, where do you look for metaphor? Well, you should look everywhere. Actually, the last place you should look for metaphor and inspiration is probably computer science, but everywhere else you should be studying. You should be mimicking. You should be putting together these elements. You should look at biology and architecture and dance and all of the human forms that depict the motion of bodies through space and the evolution of causality in time. Uh, and nowhere and no language does that better than the amazing human language of cinema. 130 years old, let's say, uniquely is able to depict those ideas, the motions through space, the landscape, the way bodies interact with each other, the way emotion and narrative interact through time. And we built this system as a test of that principle. This is a system in which you use cinema as an input-output device. Gesturally, you're able to scrub through 24 different movies, a frame at a time, and when you find a frame you like, you can pull it apart. You can pull an individual element, an actor, a prop, a bit of architecture or landscape out of the movie, put it down on the table, and then go to some movie next door and pull out another element and commit absolute cinematic heresy by assembling a melange of pieces that were never meant to go together on a table. And so maybe, maybe this is cinematic heresy, maybe this is the future of editing, but more importantly than that, for us at Oblong, this is a metaphor. This is a metaphor for how powerful your UI should make you in the context of all of your data, your digital data, your documents, your applications. It should all look and feel like this. And when I say feel, I mean that it should feel exhilarating. It is possible for a UI to feel exhilarating in the same way that skydiving or skiing or singing or laughing or composing music or playing the piano makes you feel. All of those bits that remind you that you're a mind, a human mind encapsulated in a living biological body, the tingle along your spine that means that you're human. The UI can do that, and you should always aspire to that. 
Six, another weird legacy of uh, the way we've been building computation is that it's been getting smaller and smaller. And this is indeed a beautiful bit of computation. You take it with you. It's rarely more than a centimeter from your skin. Whether that's good or bad is unclear, but it's always available. Is it enough? Is this enough space to examine and analyze and make predictions and make recommendations about the moment-to-moment -moment evolution and operation of a city's, let's say, public transportation infrastructure. No, it's not. That's self-evident. And it's not simply because it's too small. Human activity, human work has a natural scale. Each different task has an inbuilt, implicit scale. And we need to build computation that acknowledges that and that provides UI and display at an appropriate scale. In our warehouse in Los Angeles, where we ship stuff to six continents, uh, going on seven, we also prototype environments for large-scale visual interaction and computation. So this is an exercise that took a designer engineer half a day to build. This is a little tiny piece of Los Angeles, low-res representations of the building. That doesn't matter. What matters is that you're able to swim through the data. You're able to immerse yourself in the stuff in the same way that would allow you to understand a landscape as you walk through it. And I guarantee you that if you put your head inside an fMRI machine as you did this, you would see very, very different neural pathways being activated, and you'd see different memories and associations and understandings being generated. More examples uh, of that same kind of environment, uh, medical imaging example uh, performed in, in consultation with the University of California at San Francisco, the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, a composite data set of brains that were suffering from degenerative diseases. The physicians and engineers uh, that gave us this data had been looking at it for five years. But you know what it looks like when they look at it. Individual slices, one at a time. Two-dimensional slices that require human cognition to put them back together in 3D. Instead, we can put you in a space like this. And those, uh, those researchers said they'd never really understood their data before, because now they could live inside it. We extend that to an enormous pixel wall like this and look at financial data uh, or more medical imaging data. This is the evolution of a fetal quail heart uh, as it's organizing itself over a six-hour period, we're able to track individual cells now through their trajectory as the heart comes into shape. And so we're able to navigate now that time sequence, both in space and in time. You understand the physical structures, the spatial structures, and you understand the temporal sequence that gets it to where it goes. This is all simple stuff. These are all exercises that take a few hours to code up. What we're learning, though, is that it's incredibly valuable to put people inside these kinds of environments. So we have to embrace scale. We have to build computers that are small or big as we need. Seven, this is the tragedy of the 21st century. We're never going to get away from Minority Report. We're always going to have to talk about it. But at least in this context, I'm going to propose that we can reinterpret it. And the writing and the analysis that's been done of these scenes in the film for the last 14 years has mostly focused on the really cool gestural stuff, which is true, and it's cool, and it's important, but it's hardly the most important thing. Because what I was trying to depict when I designed these scenes for the movie was something more. It was that, if you think back to what's happening in these scenes, I was trying to depict that properly equipped with a more capable UI, a team, a team of collaborators who are experts, can achieve something that is not possible any other way can achieve something that's not a quantitative shift. It's not that they're doing something that they could do before, but they're doing it faster or better. They're doing it at all. Uh, and so I invite you to reinterpret what you've seen uh, now endlessly for 14 years, and I apologize for that, in those terms. There's no AI being depicted in Minority Report. That was Spielberg's previous film called AI. Here, what was really interesting is we were showing that the human brain is still the smartest computer in the room, more than one human brain is even better. And if you can give those minds and those bodies a UI that connects them all together, they can perform cognitive analysis and synthesis tasks uh, that are unprecedented today. And so let's pull that all the way forward into the real world. What we're saying is that we want UI to be an extension of human will, an exoskeleton conceptually that you strap on and that lets you become more powerful, not powerful in the sense of brute force, but in a nuanced, sophisticated sense able to change the world, grants you digital efficacy and agency. So let's do it for real. This is a system that, uh, that Oblong uses internally and makes available to its customers all over the world called Mezzanine. And it is the embodiment of that set of principles, all of the stuff foregoing. And the pixels on the wall, the front walls, the side walls, lots of displays that Mezzanine provides 
uh, are a statement. They're a political statement, and they are, for the first time, a collaborative computer. Those pixels belong to everyone. So if you think about what happens when you use a computer today, any computer you've ever, ever used, it's personal. It was called the personal computer at the beginning, and its pixels are yours and yours alone. No one else can use them. And that's great. We, we don't want to replace that, but we need a collaborative visual space like this, where everyone can throw ideas and documents and applications into the front surface, where everyone can see it at the same time, where all the ideas can run around together, and where all of it can be accessed by all of the devices that you already have. So this is the opposite of a walled garden. This is saying, bring your secondary electronic brains, bring your smartphones and your tablets and your laptops and all the stuff that has the combined wisdom of your work over the last week, month, year, decade, bring it into this room and it can project its stuff up to run around and play with everybody else's stuff where everybody can see it and make use of it, enabling and empowering, again, the smartest computers in the room. And that's a set of principles that I think takes us quite far because nothing is going to be more important to running the 21st century, to getting it to work right, to getting the 21st century to not be a disaster and instead be what it can be. Nothing will characterize that more and underlie that more than collaboration. We have to work together. The world's just that complicated. And the world's just that pleasurable. Collaboration is one of the greatest joys. Here you see um, the admission that we don't need digital whiteboards. The analog whiteboard is good. Everyone's an expert. Give them their analog whiteboard and train a digital camera on it so that stuff, that content, that stuff that people know how to do already is just automatically a first-class citizen of the space. And then you join the rooms together so colleagues across the world, around the world, on another continent can see and manipulate and contribute to exactly the same stuff that you are. Make it as close as possible to actually being in the same room and more than that, to actually being in the same human head. So we'll end there. We want to default to collaboration. Uh, we think that this kind of elaboration of the singular UI might well be the next step. So we go from command line interface to graphical user interface to collaborative user interface. And that will take us a very, very long way indeed. And the thing that we need to do is become active participants in a new dialogue about what UI is for and what we are happy with and not happy with. And we'd like to reject this kind of cult-like drive to simplicity. Uh, stuff should be as simple as possible, said Einstein, but no simpler than that. And that applies to UIs too. We're in a kind of strange lull where things are a little too simple and you can't actually do everything that you need to do. Let's get back up to here. And so to conclude, we want to build systems that are not simply agents of distraction and entertainment. We want to complement those for when you need to do real work, when you want to synthesize with systems that are based on principles of humanity, because after all, that's what they're supposed to serve, that can enhance your attention, that amplify human meaning, uh, and that get at what people are best at, which is making new things and building the world the way it ought to be. Thanks. Thanks.